Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Crime Uncut. Today, I will be looking at the disappearance of 14-year-old Tracy Lee Scott Crossley that went missing on Monday, August 1st, 1988. In this video, I will ex aim to explore the following questions. Was she abducted or did she run away from home? And if she was abducted, was she abducted by Gert van Rooyen and Joey Harroff? But before we continue, Please become a partner in crime and assault that subscribe button. You won't get arrested and you will only inspire me to make more of these kind of videos. I thank you. But Tracy Lee was the youngest child of Paul and Noreen Scott Crossley. Paul worked as a production manager for South African breweries, while Noreen worked for a company that bought metal. But Tracy's parents got divorced when she was 10 years old and she lived with her mom at this house in four, at Four Ilana Lodge in Queens Avenue, Windsor East. Tracy had two brothers, Sean, that was nine years older and worked for a bank, and then Mark, who was seven years older. Here's a photo of Noreen, Paul and Mark, as it appeared in the Build newspaper of August 4th, 1988. That would be three days after the disappearance. Uh, Tracy was a grade 8 student at the Northcliffe High School and in 1988 over a period of two months he changed schools twice. When her parents tried to reconcile in March 1988 they had to move to Alberton. After two months the parents decided to separate again and Tracy moved back to Windsor East. At the time of Tracy's disappearance Noreen was engaged and I believe she got married soon after. Now, soon after Tracy's disappearance, the family retained the services of a private investigating firm called Highlight Information Bureau. Initially, the investigations were sponsored by Pick and Pay, and then later by South African Breweries. So, a big shout out to Pick and Pay and South African Breweries. You did an amazing thing for a family in need. Now, according to the private investigators, as well as Tracy's parents, this school photo is not a good reflection of Tracy at the time, as he was more developed physically and mentally and could easily pass as a 16, 7, 17, 18 year old. Much widely accepted that Tracy Lee was kidnapped by Gert van Rooyen and Joey Harrell. And if she was indeed abducted by them, she would be the first of the six suspected victims. Now, the Wikipedia version is that Tracy was seen by a witness climbing into a yellow Volkswagen Beetle at the Cresta shopping mall. The private investigator's report says that at the time of the subject's last sighting, a yellow Volkswagen Beetle was seen in the vicinity of the Cresta Center. The Build newspaper of August 4th, 1988 reported that at about four o'clock in the afternoon, someone saw Tracy climb into a yellow Volkswagen Beetle and that there were a man and a woman inside. Now, the color wasn't yellow in a way that you would think of it. I was told it was more likely a beige or a khaki color. Now, a witness on a Facebook group said that uh, she saw a yellow Volkswagen Beetle drove past them, turning into Judges Avenue from Republic Road on Cresta side. So you can see on this map, uh, it's not clear if the vehicle made a left or a right turn at this intersection. So when this witness was asked if Tracy was inside the car, the witness answered that the driver had dark hair and that the beetle attracted her attention because of its strange color. She said that she only learned of Tracy's disappearance later and were not looking out for her when they spotted the vehicle. The owner recalled the incident later that evening. Now here are a few observations. Firstly, they did not see Tracy in the vehicle. They only saw a man with brown hair. They noticed the beetle only due to its unusual color, not because it was chasing away at high speed. Now at the time, Gert van Rooyen worked for a company called Dell clamped industries and they installed fire doors. At the time of Tracy's disappearance, 
He supposedly had to pass through the vicinity of the Cresta Mall to do a job at the SABC in Auckland Park. Apparently, he had access to a similarly, a similarly colored Volkswagen Beetle that belonged to a girl who worked for him and owed him back rentals for living in a windy house behind his main home at 227 Malerbe Street, Pretoria. He supposedly kept the vehicle for nearly four months and used it at will. But Tracy had the cousin who owned the Volkswagen Beetle, apparently eggshell in color. He was 40 years old at the time, divorced and lived in Delaray. He was briefly interviewed by the investigators and made a good impression and was thereafter not considered a suspect. In turn, he has a cousin who also had access to the vehicle. Although he was a serious suspect for a while, the investigators and the police could not find anything incriminating against him. Now coming back to the color of the beetle. I was told that the beetle could have had a khaki or a base color. And we knew the cousin's beetle was an eggshell color. Could it be that one person's yellow can be another person's base and one person's base can be another's eggshell? Well, the point what I'm really trying to make is that there were probably many of these kinds of beetles around. And then there is this note that some say provide a connection between Tracy Lee and Gert van Rooyen. Although the date stamp is not clear, it appears that it was mailed to Tracy's parents in 1993. That's quite some time after uh, Tracy disappeared. And by that time, Noreen has already moved from her house in Windsor East and the envelope was forwarded to her. The note says, during August 1988, a woman fitting Mrs. Joey Harrop's description was in a company of young girls in a blue and white combi, was doing some inquiry about an empty house at number 13, 11th Street, Greymont, saying the church wants to buy the house for its minister. I hope this is some clue. Anonymous. Tracy is not mentioned anywhere in this note, so we cannot presume that just because this note was sent to Tracy's mother, that one of the girls in the combi was Tracy. That would be a stretch. So what I presented to you, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. That's all there is. There's nothing more that links Gert van Rooyen to Tracy Lee. No direct eyewitnesses and no forensic evidence of any kind. Nothing that forms the basis for the 35 year long belief that Tracy was lured by Gert van Rooyen and Joey Harrow into the Volkswagen Beetle at the Cresta Center. For example, this appeared in the Marula in Marula Media as recent as January the 15th, 2022. It says that back then Van Rooyen and Harrow were positively linked to the disappearance of Tracy Lee Scott Crossley. And then this in the Sunday Times of 23rd of December, 2016. It was in that fateful walk that Tracy Lee was lured into the car of pedophile Gert Van Rooyen and his partner, Joey Harrow. Ladies and gentlemen, now that we've looked at the evidence in support of an abduction, let's weigh it objectively against the evidence that Tracy ran away from home. Please note that this video is not about Gert van Rooyen. And just because I've made an argument based on the evidence that it's unlikely that he was involved in Tracy's disappearance, I'm not implying that he wasn't involved in the abduction and abuse of other girls. I've not yet formed an opinion about these other cases as I've not looked at the evidence myself. I emigrated from South Africa to Canada 22 years ago and have not been exposed to the news and rumors about these cases in the media. And in 11 years before that, while I was in South Africa, I had paid zero attention to anything about Gert van Rooyen in the news. But let's start at the beginning. Within the first six weeks after Tracy's disappearance, her mother Noreen explained what happened in the day in a meeting with the private investigators on the 2nd of September 1988, that would be four weeks after the, dis the disappearance, as well as in an interview with Janie Allen from the Sunday Times on September the 11th 1988, 
six weeks after. Many years later, she also did an interview with the Marie Claire magazine in 2006 and with the You magazine in 2017. Now, especially in the 2017 interview, Noreen's version of events was quite different from what she told investigators and the media in 1988. As one can reasonably expect that Noreen's memory of such a traumatic day should still be quite fresh six weeks after, I will reconstruct the events of that day from her interviews with the private investigators and Johnny Allen, as well as with information provided by Mark, Tracy's brother. Now, on the Saturday before her disappearance, Tracy wasn't feeling well. Her mother took her to the doctor, who diagnosed her with a lung infection and prescribed medication. In the private investigator interview, she said the infection was bad, and she told Yanni Allen the infection was mild. Noreen said that she wanted to take Tracy to work with her, but it was decided that Tracy should rather stay home. She went to Tracy's room, woke her up, switched on the television, and gave Tracy her medication. She then asked Tracy what she was going to do with herself, and Tracy said that perhaps she would go to the mall later, to the Cresta Mall, to watch a movie. Then there was a discussion about money, because Tracy didn't have any. The, the previous Saturday, her mother had to borrow 35 rand from Tracy to pay the maid because she, she forgot to draw cash. Tracy received a 40 rand monthly allowance from her mother and 15 rand from her father. It was decided that her mother would leave a credit card with Tracy and they arranged to go shopping together that afternoon. When Tracy asked her mother what time she would be home to go shopping, uh, Tracy's mother answered that she would be back as soon as possible after lunch. And then Noreen left for work at about 7.30 a.m. In the interview with Janie Allen, Noreen said that she thought that Tracy wouldn't go with her friends to the mall, as Tracy recently had a fallout with them the previous week after a disagreement about discos. Apparently, Tracy didn't approve of young girls going to discos because people judge you by areas you gravitate to. I would rather think that Tracy didn't go to with anyone to the mall because all her friends were in school. This was a normal school day. So when Noreen pulled up outside the flat later at 2.40 p.m., she hooted and immediately became concerned when Tracy didn't run downstairs to meet her and to greet her as she usually did. Noreen then went inside and saw that the television was on with the sound quite high. The dog, a toy pom, was locked up in the kitchen. She saw Tracy's purse, the credit cards, some loose chains. And it, to her, it seemed like Tracy did walk to the Cresta shopping mall. She didn't go to the movies. Instead, she withdrew 20 rand on the credit card and did some shopping. She bought Whispers chocolate somewhere some tights from Woolworths, and pencils and pens from CNA. On Tracy's bed, next to a half-eaten pack of whispers, she found an open biology book, which Tracy apparently borrowed from a friend that morning to make notes. She also noticed that a pink double bed blanket was missing that was usually folded at the foot of the bed. Later, in a police statement, 18 months later, Noreen mentioned for the first time that she saw a half a glass of coke, which was already flat and warm. Noreen ended the Jenny Allen interview by saying, I know she's alive. I believe that she might be involved in some sex slave or prostitution racket. They might want to send her overseas. Now, the Cresta Mall was about 1.6 kilometers away from Tracy's house and would have taken her about 20 minutes to walk. The temperature on an early August winter morning in Johannesburg typically ranges between 7 and 15 degrees Celsius. Apparently, her brother Mark was home that morning and Tracy supposedly asked him to go with her to the Cresta Mall and he said no, he had other things to do. 
He must have left the home at some stage because when his mother got home later, he wasn't there. Now Mark said that he heard from three reliable sources that Tracy was seen in the mall that afternoon. A guy he knows who was previously who has previously shown an interest in Tracy supposedly saw Tracy walking into CNA at about 3.30 p.m. Walking in with nothing and walking out with nothing. Then there was a cleaner that works at the cinema that saw Tracy during a break between 3.30 p.m. and 3.45 p.m. And then there's another person that also saw Tracy walking in Cresta. Now Noreen was adamant that Tracy would not have gotten into a stranger's car and therefore she must have been abducted by someone she knew and trusted. Before I go further, other than the names of Tracy and her family, the names of witnesses and people involved in this case, I will not be using their real names. I've done this in order to protect their privacy, as some of them may still be alive today. Now, private investigators visited the Cresta Mall on, on September the 12th to make inquiries as to whether anyone had seen Tracy there on August the 1st. None of the staff at the CNA recognized Tracy, and they were of no assistance. They spoke to the cleaner that worked at the cinema, and she admitted that Tracy was well known to her and that she did see Tracy on August the 1st in the company of other females and a large blonde haired young man. It seems that this man called Wayne C was a friend of Mark's and has previously expressed an interest in Tracy. According to Mark, Wayne C went to Durban soon after Tracy's disappearance. Now this Wayne C at some Point was employed in the arcade of the Cresta Mall. But by September 12th, when the private investigators came to the mall, he was no longer employed there. I'm not sure if he was employed at the arcade on August 1st. Further inquiries by the private investigators revealed that he sometimes went by the alias of Wayne T. Same first name, different last name. Now, after finding that Tracy wasn't home as expected, without having left a note, Noreen called all of Tracy's friends, but none of them knew where Tracy were. After, the after that, the police were called, and the police, members of an armed response security company, and members of the family searched for Tracy throughout the night, including at the Cresta Mall and the surrounding areas. And the police also interviewed her friends. And the police did not notice any signs of a struggle inside the house. The next day, additional police were brought in and the search continued for several more days. All leads received were followed up without any success. Finally, an abduction docket was opened. In the 2017 interview with the U magazine, Noreen said that if she knew Tracy was planning to go to the mall alone, she would have stopped it because she never allowed Tracy to walk alone. She said that she was suddenly gripped by anxiety and since she didn't have a landline at home, she decided to leave work early at 11.30 to go check in on Tracy. And when she got home, Tracy wasn't there. She doesn't believe the story that Tracy got into the Volkswagen Beetle and that and she was convinced that Tracy came home and that she was abducted from there by Gert van Rooyen and Joey Harrell. She believed that it was not a spur of the moment decision and that van Rooyen and Harrell must have planned the abduction well in advance by studying her movements. They knew her comings and goings. Noreen suspects van Rooyen and Harrell persuaded Tracy to go with them by making up a story maybe telling her that her mom had been in an accident. So what we seem to have a conflict here between the mother, whose adamant Tracy was abducted from home, and the information that Mark gathered, 
some of which was confirmed by the private investigator's interview with the lady that worked at the cinema, for example. So let's work with what we have so far to speculate about the possible scenario that connects all the dots. In part, this is just an exercise to show that Noreen's version cannot be used as solid evidence of an abduction. So the mother left behind her credit card as though she said that she might go to the mall later. Before going out, she poured herself a glass of Coke and worked through her biology book. Half a glass of Coke into her studies, she decided she had enough and it was time to go to Cresta. She asked her brother to go with her, but he said no, so she walked to Cresta alone. When she got there, she withdrew money from her ATM and bought herself the tights from Woolworths, the pencils and pen from the CNA, and a bag of whispers somewhere. Then she met someone and they talked. And perhaps she complained about problems and that she wishes that she could run away. And then this person offered to help her. However, this person could not leave immediately, possibly because he or she either worked in the mall and had to finish a shift or had other business to finish first. But they agreed that Tracy should go home, fetch her things, and come back to the mall so they can leave at the end of the shift or when the business was done. So Tracy went back home, but before she left, I think there's a good likelihood that she withdrew more money from her mother's bank account. And on the way home, she could have eaten some of the chocolate. And when she got home, she put down everything that she had with her, her credit card, the money, the, 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 the wallet, the, the, the stuff that she bought including a half bag of chocolates on the bed. And then she packed a bag, rolled up a blanket, and then she returned to the mall. It's also possible that during a break or a lunch break, her helper actually drove her to the house and then drove her back to the mall. However, when she got back to the mall, she left her belongings in the helper's vehicle and then went inside to wait for her helper to finish up. It was at this time that Tracy was observed by the cinema's cleaning lady hanging out with some females and the blonde haired male. Above, I've simply given a hypothetical scenario to demonstrate that Noreen's vision can also fit into a runaway scenario and not just an abduction scenario. Now I'm going to work through some sworn statements by, made by several witnesses that saw Tracy Lee alive after her disappearance and even communicated with her. I must stress, like I do with all statements, I've treated these statements with caution, realizing that they may not be fully and wholly truthful in all aspects. I've made a great effort to analyze and compare the different statements to see if there are any points where they corroborate each other. I think you will see emerge from my analysis almost a neural network of corroborative interconnections that in my opinion provides a significantly higher degree of confidence that at least until February 1990, Tracy was still alive and moving around compared to the alternative scenario that she was abducted by Gert van Rooyen and likely deceased. It's not to say that Tracy wasn't abducted later in life. For example, to be trafficked out of the country. But that would not have been the work of Van Rooyen and Harov. So let's start with a witness called Leanne. Leanne lost her family in a car accident when she was five years old and were then raised by step parents. She claims that her father sexually abused her when she was four years old, and as a result of that, she became a rebellious later in life and she was sent to a reform school in Constantia, Cape Town. In about July 1988, she deserted from the school, something that she often did, and she went to Johannesburg, where she stayed with a Greek guy in Hilbra. At that time, she was only 15 years old and in Standard 7, Grade 9. Leanne was arrested by the police on August the 25th and the police found that she was in possession of a fake identity document. 
While in custody and waiting to be transferred back to the reform school in Constantia, she was interviewed by the police and the investigators. She said that while she lived in Hillbrow, she regularly visited nightclubs and discos. And one of her favorite places to hang out was the Metro Video Arcade near the old Metro Theater in Hillbrow. It was apparently a popular place for deserters and runaways to congregate. She was known in that community as someone that would help and provide advice to other deserters and runaways. One Wednesday in August 1988, she was approached by an English speaking girl wearing pink trousers and a yellow top. This would be inside the video arcade. This girl asked her if her name was Lee. When she said yes, the girl said that her name was Lee as well. Then Lee Ann joked that it cannot be because there are too many Lees. And then the girl said that her name is actually Tracy Lee and that she ran away from home. When asked where she ran away from, Tracy said the Cresta Center. And when asked where she wanted to go, Tracy Lee said that she wanted to go to Durban. Now, during an interview with the parents, an investigator asked them where they think Tracy would go if she did run away from home. And they answered Durban. It was a favorite holiday destination, having been there on several occasions with her mother and father. Then Lee Ann asked Tracy why she ran away from home. And according to Lee Ann, Tracy told her that she had a diary in which she described in detail how she slept with a man. Apparently her mother found the diary and they had an argument about it. Tracy said that she couldn't handle it and decided to run away. But this ties in with a statement made by a neighbor who heard an argument between Tracy and her mother about a week before the disappearance. I have no information on whether they knew what the argument was about. It also ties in with Tracy's father who told the private investigators that he believes the argument had something to do with the diary. Now Tracy did have a diary in which she made all kinds of personal notes and kept letters, etc. After Tracy's father took possession of the diary, refusing even the private investigators to look at, to look at it, the police did eventually take possession of it but it seems some pages were torn from it. There's no certainty as to when, why, and by whom these pages were removed. It is known that the man Tracy supposedly had sex with was an older man, and his identity is known to the police. It's not known if the sex was consensual or not, but irrespective, Tracy was only 14 years old, and this constitutes statutory rape. And under current South African law, there is no statute of limitations on rape. It should be noted that in Leanne's initial interviews, she purposefully did not tell the police nor the investigators about why Tracy ran away. Firstly, she didn't like the police officer that interviewed her. And secondly, she didn't want Tracy's father to find out. This information only came to light when a final statement was taken from her on March 23rd, 1990. Leanne then asked Tracy how she was getting to Durban and Tracy said that she was going to go with Wayne T. And when Tracy pointed out Wayne T, who was somewhere in the arcade, Lee and recognized him as someone she had met before. Tracy asked Leanne twice if Wayne could be trusted and both times Leanne answered yes. Leanne wanted to know which car Wayne drives and Tracy pointed out a red orange Ford Escort parked outside in the street. I think that this is an instance where Lee Ann twisted the truth a bit. It's likely that she and this Wayne work together and when Tracy approached her for her advice on how to go to Durban, she put him, she put her in touch with Wayne. And this ties in what she told private investigators on the 26th of September when they asked her if she put Tracy onto Wayne, she said, yeah. So Tracy, or I mean, Leanne has previously met 
this Wayne T in Durban. And she stayed with him and hanged out with him for a while. So they knew each other quite well. Leanne managed to give the names of some people that Wayne T. Knowed, knew in Durban, and later some of these people admitted that they knew Wayne T. So according to Leanne, Tracy went to Durban with this Wayne T. Now I need to point out that it cannot be confirmed with absolute certainty that this Wayne T. was the same Wayne C. that was a friend of Mark's and that Tracy knew from the Cresta Mall. But what are the chances that Wayne C, which also went by the alias of Wayne T, and it was seen with Tracy at the mall, and that according to Mark went to Durban shortly after Tracy's disappearance, is a different person. And for the rest of the video, when I use the name Wayne, I will be referring to this Wayne T. The timing of when Tracy went to Durban is not clear. But it was likely before August the 26th when Leanne was arrested. Reports were that Tracy, during the first week after her disappearance, stayed in a flat in Kerk Street, Johannesburg. An informant told the police that Tracy frequently visited the Kiss Club, which was a popular nightclub in Hillbrow in the 1980s. Coincidentally, the informant recognized Mark, Tracy's brother, as someone that often hanged out at the Kiss Club. However, it's not known whether he and Tracy were ever there at the same time after Tracy's disappearance. According to the informant, Leanne told her that she knew a runaway called Tracy, and this informant actually witnessed how Leanne pulled Tracy into a toilet stall one day and told her that the police is looking for her and that she should get away. According to the informant, this Leanne was pregnant. The investigators that interviewed Leanne on September the 26th confirmed that she was pregnant and that she subsequently had a miscarriage. In and around the Durban area, there were numerous sightings of Tracy. Several private investigators went to Durban to search for her, to interview witnesses, to follow up on tips and leads and to question people that Leanne identified as knowing Wayne. Seems like investigators came across at least two lookalikes, so it's impossible to say how many of the sightings were of the real Tracy. By September the 14th, the private investigators had already received information from a source that Tracy was observed in the XL Roadhouse, a popular uh, beachfront restaurant in Durban, in the presence of Wayne T and two other guys, Butch and Freddy. So on September 18th, the investigators came across Freddy and they showed him a photo without saying who it was. And this Freddy looked at the photo and said that he, that her name was Tracy and that she also used the name Lee. He said he has seen her in the presence of Wayne and another person by the name of Butch. He said that the girl with Wayne was a runaway from Johannesburg and they might find her at the XL Roadhouse. So just to recap, Lee Ann, while in custody, told the police prior to September the 8th that Tracy went to Durban with Wayne. And then six days later, someone saw Tracy with Wayne, Butch and Freddy in the XL Roadhouse in Durban. And then Freddy confirmed a couple of days later that he has seen Wayne, Tracy and Butch that they may be at the XL Roadhouse. Now in Durban, the police came across a runaway girl called Priyana. She lived in a place called Drummond House, which was a place where prostitutes congregated and lived together like a family. They were all bound by an oath of secrecy that they would never give each other away. According to Brianna, at one time Tracy's father and brother arrived at the house to inquire about Tracy, even showed a photo around. Although Tracy was inside the house, probably just mere meters away, she did not give Tracy away. We know that Mark and his father was in Durban on Saturday, August the 27th, to look for Tracy. During the same time, Tracy's mother said that she received a phone call from Tracy that she was being held captive 
and that she wanted to come home. She said she was in Durban and that she could see a play park through a window. Now I've tried to find out if Hart van Rooyen might have been in Durban at that time, but it seems very little is known about his movements in October 1988. So let's return to the statement made by Leanne. She said that she knew someone called Susie and that sometimes he and Susie lived together and that this Susie also knew Tracy Lee. She said that Susie was a lesbian or a bisexual and she used to live in a flat in Hospital Street opposite the Hillbrow Hospital. So in her statement, Leanne identified two people that she knew also knew Tracy, Rika and Charlie. Now, Rika was introduced to Tracy prior to her disappearance in 1987 by a guy named Charlie, who claimed to be Tracy's boyfriend. Thereafter, Tracy occasionally visited Rika in the flat where she stayed. Rika, who was a deserter, was then arrested and shipped back to her school. She eventually ended up in the same, re in the same reform school as Leanne in Constantia. Then, during December 1989, for a summer holiday break, Rika returned to Johannesburg and decided to look up a friend of hers that worked for an escort agency. So she went from escort agency to escort agency to look for this friend. And then in one of the agencies, she by chance came across Tracy Lee. And when she asked Tracy what she was doing there, Tracy said that was the only way that she could earn money. Tracy asked Rika please not to report her for the sake of the 15,000 Rand reward. And Rika said that she would never do that. Rika then asked Tracy whether she has ever been booked out to someone famous. And Tracy said that her father once called the agency to book her, but then she intervened and put a stop to it. Now an article by reporter Felicity Levine that appeared in the Sunday Times of 11th of February 1990 and it was copied in the book Children of Sorrow by Chris Marais. It's reported that Tracy's father disclosed to the reporter that he has firm evidence that his daughter is alive and working as an escort girl. The article tells us how Tracy's father along with a private investigator scoured the sordid underworld of Johannesburg and Durban to look for Tracy. After locating her, her father even made a paid escort agency date with his daughter, but she didn't turn up. The father said that he got these terrible phone calls with incoherent sobbing and slurred speech saying, come fetch me, come fetch me, and then the line would be dead. It has recently come to my attention that after the appearance of this article in the Sunday Times, the poll sued the Sunday Times because the editors changed the reporter's original version and twisted Paul's words. Where Paul said she might be working, the editor changed it to my daughter is an escort. Paul also apparently said that we looked everywhere for her, we followed every lead. Lots of them were false. Someone even said that she was in Durban working in a brothel, but this was nonsense. So this published article goes on to say that in March 1989, about nine months before Rika met Tracy at an escort agency, the owner or boss of the private investigating company that worked with the family found Tracy at the escort agency in Bria Street. He said the girl was clearly Tracy, had the same mannerisms and unmistakable distinguishing marks. For example, Tracy had a very distinctive scar on an index finger. He said Tracy took a 250 rand down payment and signed a receipt with the name Tracy and that her father recognized the handwriting as being Tracy's. Tracy, however, did not pitch up at the appointment and this disappeared from the escort agency. Now, it also come to my attention that this is not 100% accurate. It was not the boss of the investigating firm that found Tracy. It was an agent and employee of his. I was told that this agent immediately called his boss and informed him where Tracy is. The boss then called Tracy's father and asked him to come to the escort agency immediately in order to do an identification. 
However, Paul, for some reason, did not pitch up. I imagine it was after this incident that Paul, who now knew exactly where Tracy worked, called to make a booking. And I can just imagine his frustration when she didn't pitch up. Again, she stayed one step ahead of him, just out of reach. The investigators interviewed the owner of the escort agency a while later, and this escort agency was called the Elegance Escort Agency. And the owner indicated that Tracy Lee was alive and that she ran away from home because of some kind of argument. However, later after the newspaper article came out, the owner or a manager of the agency changed their story that it was not Tracy, but another 23 year old woman. Well, I think there's a strong likelihood that this was just a case of damage control. Which agency wants to face heavy scrutiny for employing a 14 year old escort? Let's return to the statement by, by Rika. On February 1st, 1990, this is like two weeks after Catherine Ruins' death, a school psychologist picked Rika up from the Cape Town airport. And in the car, they had a discussion about Catherine Ruin. Rika told the psychologist that Tracy was not a Gerten Ruin victim as she has seen Tracy Lee alive in an escort agency. The school psychologist also made a sworn statement confirming that this discussion took place. A week or so later, some staff at the school told Rika that it came out in a newspaper that Tracy was working in an escort agency. And that's indeed the case. The story of the father and the private detective Finding Tracy in an escort agency in Brea Street appeared in the Sunday Times of 11th of February 1990, 10 days after Nicole told the psychologist that she saw Tracy working in an escort agency. An article in the report from about the same time states that Tracy's previous employee, i.e. the owner of the escort agency on Brea Street, was associated with the Taiwanese Mafia he specializes in trafficking, drug smuggling, and prostitution. It should, however, be noted that Erica's statement was taken on the 22nd of March 1990, and there is a possibility, although she knew of Tracy's working in an escort agency beforehand, that she obtained information about the father's attempt to book Tracy from the article and not from Tracy herself. Therefore, this corroboration needs to be viewed with caution. So based on information received from an informant, it appears Tracy must have returned from Durban sometime in November 1988. A friend of the informant even told Tracy that she should go back to Durban as the police is still looking for her. Now Tracy was often seen in the Kiss Club in the presence of a friend of hers that worked at the Romance Escort Agency in the vicinity of Brea Street. And this informant also worked with another independent private detective. And often the informant would call this detective and tell him that Tracy is in the club. But always by the time he got there, Tracy was gone already. Apparently one day the detective saw Tracy and a friend inside the escort agency where the friend worked. In 1989, Reba was visiting a friend of hers in a flat in Fairview. While standing on a balcony, Reba saw another girl, another friend of hers, called Elsa, down on the sidewalk, talking to another girl. Reba then invited them up, and Elsa introduced her friend as Tracy Lee. Reba thought she recognized the girl as the same Tracy Lee that she saw on all the missing posters that went up around the city and in the municipal buses, even though her hair was more brown and blonde at this time. She did not call the police as she was not 100% sure it was the real Tracy Lee. About four to five months later, in February 1990, Reba again ran into a friend Elsa and asked her where this Tracy Lee was. And Elsa said that she was not going to tell as she did not want the police to find out where Tracy Lee is. Now what is interesting to note is that Elsa was a lesbian. And Reba's boyfriend has also seen Tracy Lee before and knew that Tracy Lee lived with a lesbian in the flat opposite the Hillbrow Hospital. 
So it's also interesting to note that the boyfriend who worked in Durban uh, may have known Gracie from her days in Durban. So here we have a tie in between a statement of Leanne and Reba, both talking about Tracy that lived with a lesbian opposite the Hilborough Hospital. Belinda worked as a cleaner in the Soper Lodge in Soper Street in Berea. About a month after the death of Gert van Rooyen, on Monday, February the 19th, 1990, at about 4.30 p.m., a young man and woman approached the gate of the lodge and asked to be let in. When Belinda asked them why they wanted to come in, they responded that they were scared of the police. After denying them entry, they turned and walked away. At about six o'clock that afternoon, three police officers arrived at the lodge to speak to Belinda, and they showed her a newspaper clipping of a photo of a girl, and she immediately recognized the girl as the one that came to the gate earlier that afternoon. The girl in the photo was Tracy Lee. Two days later, she got another visit from a police officer who showed her a pamphlet of the six missing girls. And she immediately recognized the girl in the top left corner as the girl that came to the gate two days earlier. Belinda was then taken to a police station in Pretoria, where she assisted the police in compiling an identity of both the girl and the man that she saw. So now let's look at one last statement, that of a security guard at the Coronia Hotel in Berea. In one of the apartments, there lived three women. One of them appeared to be 16 years old, and he noticed that she did not attend school. He often saw her standing on the balcony of the apartment. He suspected she might be the missing girl, Tracy Lee, but wasn't sure. He didn't pay much attention and did nothing about his suspicion. Seems that she moved out of the apartment during December 1989. Then on February the 24th, 1995, days after Belinda did the identikit. This identikit was published in the Build newspaper, and the security guard immediately recognized it as the man that he regularly saw standing on the balcony with the free woman. He immediately contacted the police, and he told the police that while the woman was staying there, there were many men coming and going, but there was one man that visited regularly, and that he drove a red Ford Escort. So here we have a tie in between the identikit that Belinda made of the man she saw was someone that looked like Tracy and the security guard that saw a woman that looked like Tracy with a man that matched the description that Belinda saw. And then there is the red Ford Escort, the same color and makeup car that Leanne said Wayne drives, the same Wayne that went to Durban with Tracy. So from the possible sightings and witness reports, it seems that during 1989, Tracy lived in and around Hillbrow, likely working as an escort. In spite of a 15,000 rand reward in her head, the police never managed to find her. While they had no problem finding and arresting deserters like Leanne and Rika and sending them back to their reform schools. George Boucher, father of a dead Boucher, one of the missing six, said that one day while searching for his own daughter, he found Tracy Lee in an apartment in Hillbrow, close to the Hillbrow Tower. Apparently, Tracy did not want to leave and Mr. Boucher left her behind. He said that he did inform Tracy's parents of him meeting Tracy. I'm not sure when this happened. Then it seems at some stage an investigator by the name of Doreen Gunn found Tracy working in an escort agency in Benoni under the name of Erica. Doreen showed photos of Tracy and Erica to an investigative journalist who admitted that there were similarities. In 2001, an escort called Wendy, who worked with Erica, made a statement that confirmed certain physical similarities between Erica and Tracy. Both were left handed, green eyes, gap between the front teeth, a mark under the breast, and a mole on the left shoulder. Both went to school at Krugersdorp at some time. Both had the demeanor of a ballet dancer, and both had the same way of brushing their hair back. Wendy also stated that Erica worked at an escort agency, or used to work at the escort agency in Breast Street. 
According to Doreen, she has spoken to Tracy's mother several times and Tracy's dad once, and they, like the investigating officer, did not seem to take it seriously. The reporter apparently once took the mother to the escort agency to meet Erica, but neither of them showed recognition or admitted that they knew each other. I've heard a rumor from two sources that Tracy was later seen on a game farm in Botswana. I'm not in possession of any independent information to corroborate this. Now I implore everyone watching this video, please not to judge any, anyone involved in the saga. Let's not stigma, stigmatize the parents of runaway children. Quite often children run away due to factors related to mental health, addictions, medical conditions, problems with their peers, etc. It's not always the result of what parents may or may not have done. Both sides can be victims. In the US, between 1.6 and 2.8 million youth run away each year. To conclude, why didn't the police ever find Tracy, a young white girl working for more than a year in the escort agencies of Hillbrow with a 15,000 rand reward in her head and she was not found? And why is it that 35 years later her disappearance is still tied to Gert van Rooyen, despite the police being in possession of all the information I presented to you and even more? Some very powerful and dangerous organizations and people of some strong government connections were very active in the murky underground world of prostitution in places like Hillborough. In addition to the various mafias, such as for example the Taiwanese and the Russians, there were also CCB operatives, such as for example Stahlberger and Ferdi Barnard. Stahlberger owned the Breaker Hotel in Berea, which apparently was in the center of the underworld of prostitution, drug dealing and other illegal activities. Various police officers in and out of uniform and various ex-CCB agents were often seen there. It's also known that Ferdi himself owned a brother. Stahlberger was also a friend of Alex Kouvaris, a Greek businessman with links to prostitution and drug trafficking. He owned a nightclub called In The Mix and a number of hotels including the Safari International, the Park Lane and the Quirinale, all of which were connected to Vice. Kavaris even employed Starburger as a manager of the Park Lane. In 1997, this Kavaris was arrested after he allegedly shot four of his employees inside the Safari Hotel after a disagreement over wages. Two of the employees died and two were injured. Hours after his arrest, he was released on 2,000 rand bail. Later, he walked away a free man, apparently due to a poor police investigation and the disappearance of five witnesses. It helps to have friends in high places. We already know that Tracy worked for an escort agency that was associated with the Taiwanese Mafia. So it's not unlikely that Tracy continued to work in an establishment owned by one of these men or organizations, and that she therefore became an asset that had the protection of the people that she worked for. It would therefore not have been wise for anyone to rat her out, to search for her or to find her even the police. Then we must also remember that these women who worked in the underground sex industry and their handlers were all in it together and they looked out for one another, just like the residents of Dramat House, a fraternity of some sort. I imagine the moment that the cop or a suspicious person made an appearance and start sniffing around, word would spread like wildfire and all of those at risk would run for cover and hide in the nearest hole and lay low with the help and support of others until the heat is off. I think that is why Tracy just always managed to stay one step ahead of those looking for her, in Durban as well as in Hillbrow. She simply did not want to be found, and she had the help of people in doing that. Let's talk about the Gerten Ruin connection. As one girl after another disappeared, the faces were added to this pamphlet, figuratively. These girls were missing. Even if they knew that Tracy was a runaway, she was still missing and belonged on the same pamphlet as all his other girls. And then when Gert and Roy and Joy Haro were caught in 1990, it was believed that a connection could be established between Gert and Roy and some of these girls.
on the pamphlet. And naturally, attempts were made to see if all the other girls, like Gracie, could be connected to Fratton Rowan as well. And somehow the yellow Volkswagen and, and the anonymous note provided that connection. You would be surprised to know that most of the affidavits that I analyzed for this video were only taken in February and March of 1990. That is after the death of Fred van Rooyen and Joey Haro. So if at the time of Van Rooyen's death someone wanted to look at Tracy's docket, they would not have been able to see the whole picture as I have presented to you. However, I do think there were enough information in the private investigators' reports, in the interviews with informants, etc., to suggest that the link of Gert van Rooyen is highly unlikely. It also seems likely that the Gert van Rooyen investigators did not even look at the docket. And what's also disconcerting is that the same police officer that took most of the statements in February and March was also involved in the Gert van Rooyen case to some extent. And then there is this newspaper article that appeared in the Sunday Times of February 11, 1990. Twisted or not, it still indicated that Tracy was alive at least until March 1989 and not in the hands of Van Rooyen. This article appeared one month after Gert van Rooyen's death. And then there are the detectives and investigators that worked the case right from the start. They had first-hand information on the information that Leanne provided in the numerous sightings in Durban and Johannesburg. And I'm aware of at least two investigators that possibly saw Tracy in the flesh. Where were these police officers that took the statements? Those that read the newspaper articles? Those that were in the front lines of the investigation when it became commonly accepted by all in the Sunder that Gert van Rooyen abducted Tracy purely on the basis that someone saw her getting into a vehicle similar to one that Gert van Rooyen may have had access to. Or perhaps it was decided by someone to no longer meddle in the business of those powerful groups and people that ruled Hillbrow. To let Tracy be the rare punit of Gert van Rooyen. Could it be? I don't know, but what I do know is that this is not a trivial matter that we can simply gloss over. While the police were searching for Tracy's remains under Van Rooyen's house, under his swimming pool, and on the beaches of KwaZulu Natal, perhaps he was somewhere alive. And that she ended up in a situation from which he desperately needed to be saved from hoping that someone would look for her and find her. But no one came because we were misdirected to look in the wrong places. You all want to know what eventually happened with Tracy. Is she still alive or has she passed away? It's a fascinating case and we would very much do and we would very much like to know that answer. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to be very clear and I cannot emphasize it enough that if Tracy is still alive, she may not want to be found. Maybe she doesn't want her life to be turned upside down. She's now an adult, almost 50 years old. She has made the decisions and she's entitled to her privacy. We need to respect that. If she wants to come out, she needs to come out on her own terms in her own time. She owes us nothing. If she's still alive, if you know where she is, please keep that information to yourself. Please don't post it in the comments below or in the Facebook or social media page. Similarly, if she had passed away and left behind the family, they too are entitled to their privacy. So let's respect that and act responsibly. If Tracy has passed away, I personally would like to be able to disclose some basic information in a way that doesn't compromise the privacy of a family, just so that we can bring proper closure to this case. And I can be emailed at mulletmedia at outlook.com. Please be aware that the Tracy Lee Scott that died in Johannesburg on May the 5th, 1996, by suicide after taking overdose of pills, is not Tracy Lee Scott Crossley. I've seen a photo of her, and it's not the same person. Sadly, Tracy's father has since passed away. 
However, her mother and brothers are still alive. I know that they have been through some very difficult times, so let's continue to keep them in our thoughts and prayers. That's all for today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your time. Until next time, thank you.